Good morning. Again, welcome to Anthropology 4310, uh, Theories of Culture. Uh, today we have uh, two tasks. One is to finish this uh, section on functionalism, and the second one is to do an overview of the entire course that we've had up to this point for purposes of reviewing for your exam. Uh, and I think we can do both fairly readily. And also, as a part of that second activity, uh, I'm prepared to, hopefully, to uh, <laughs> answer any questions that you may have regarding uh, anything we've covered so far in lecture, even anything you've had in your readings. In other words, if there's something you need input on, it's still fair to get it today. And I, I hope that some of you have formulated questions, uh, if nothing else, for those who in place of our home viewing audience so that you can ask their questions for them since they're not here, quote, to do it. Okay, uh, last time uh, I started or, uh, a lecture on functionalism and, and uh, talked pretty much about uh, characteristics of functionalism as a model or as a construct in anthropological theory. And as you'll see from today's handout, which I'll be addressing in a moment, uh, this larger uh, notion of functionalism or interrelatedness uh, is nothing new uh, in Western culture and has, and as I indicated in other, in other lectures at other times, has been around for quite a while. But I did talk about uh, functionalism as being a model which uh, promotes notions of society that are organismic, that are interdependent, a historical and <laughs> synchronic. Uh, so I got all of them out, yeah. And uh, then we, uh, after going through those characteristics of that construct, uh, we talked a little bit about specifically about Malinowski and uh, Radcliffe Brown. And uh, I'll start off there by continuing to do that a little bit. Uh, are th first, are there any questions about anything I covered last time? No questions? I'm ready to answer. <laughs> uh, whatever. You have none. Good. <laughs> okay. Uh, of the two, Radcliffe Brown would be the one that's most known for his theoretical contribution. And uh, many people have even said about his work that he uh, kind of not plagiarizes, nothing that um, direct, but that his, all of his writings, in theory anyway, seem to be vaguely reminiscent of Durkheim. So they're not sure that any of these ideas were original with Radcliffe Brown. And Radcliffe Brown may have been rather a person who should receive credit for having translated those notions from the French into English. Uh, that may be doing him a bit of an injustice, but it's at least what has been said. Malos Malinowski's theory of um, functionalism uh, is not, at least in the theoretical realms, considered to be as worthy a contribution. Uh, but he, as I indicated last time, is always touted as being the um, example par excellence of field work and being a field worker and doing participative observation. And I explained already that that was largely a historical uh, incident because he was a naturalized British subject who during the Second World War, or excuse me, the First World War, <laughs> makes our wars up here, uh, uh, was on the, uh, in the Trobian Islands and then was not allowed to, to move out of that region of the, of the Pacific. So his uh, virtue <laughs> in being there four years was not out of dedication but out of confinement by the British government. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, both he and Radcliffe Brown have very honored positions in British anthropology. You know, there's a British anthropology university system is very different than ours. Uh, I mean, I think sometimes if you have occasion to discuss things with a professor here or an instructor or whatever, you, you may think that they're uh, snide <laughs> or uh, uh, lofty in the terms of the way they talk about other folks, but it's nothing compared to the British system. 
meaning that there always was an institutionalized competition that was embedded in the structure of the university system. And Radcliffe Brown and Malinowski represent that. They both had chairs uh, in anthropology, and that means a lot in British anthropology. If you have a, just if you're a chair in anthropology, or a professor, even a full professor, it's like having, an, almost like having an endowed chair here. In other words, you're, you're big stuff. <laughs> and they were big stuff in terms of uh, the students they trained, the uh, influence they had, and as I indicated last time, both of them taught for considerable periods of time in the United States and, and made a lasting impression on American anthropology as well. Um, Radcliffe Brown's approach or influence on anthropology, I think, comes about primarily through his tenure at the University of Chicago uh, and the Chicago School of Sociology under a man by the name of uh, Robert Park. Um, and if you'll look, uh, a major anthropologist from the University of Chicago was Robert Redfield, and his wife's name was Margaret Park Redfield. So all those names are important, and I think you can get the connection. In other words, uh, Robert Park, who was an eminent sociologist, was the father-in-law of um, <laughs> whoever I just mentioned, uh, Redfield, Robert Redfield. Uh, and that connection was important because it, 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 once you know that, and once you realize uh, that it's Radcliffe Brown that had the impact, uh, you see how it plays out in the Chicago School of Sociology in terms of, of the kinds of work that the people there were doing. And in anthropology, it became translated into the folk urban concept of Robert Redfield, which was a major avenue into the development later on of urban anthropology, anthropology of complex societies, uh, culture change, all kinds of things that were to characterize a succeeding generations, uh, at least two get decades of anthropologists. And so uh, this is where, uh, again, uh, Radcliffe Brown has that indirect influence on those of us who are students in uh, American anthropology. I think it's important to note those kinds of connections sometime. Uh, all right. Uh, Today, what I, I want to continue with is going to a handout that I have, and it will be posted on your website today for the class, as well as, by the way, will your exam uh, that you need to uh, hand in uh, a week from today. Uh, but we're going to go over this handout together, and I, th I think that will serve then to um, replace those missing notes that I have. Uh, this says most of what I needed to say about functionalism for purposes of this class. Uh, I could go into a great deal of detail, for example, about the theory of Radcliffe Brown versus the theory of Malinowski, and I will add a little more to what I said last time about Radcliffe Brown's theory before we get to the handout. But I really see little um, contribution to be made by going into Malinowski's theory, other than to say something like, uh, sometimes Malinowski's theory is touted as being more purely f functionalism than was Radcliffe Brown's. Uh, because he, he talked about that there are certain biological um, needs out there that all human populations uh, have to have uh, satisfied, uh, such as thirst, or hunger, or sex, or uh, shelter, uh, and others. And that society or culture arises uh, out in the efforts to satisfy those biological needs. Um, so in that sense, it's, it's more purely functional than was uh, Radcliffe Brown's. Oftentimes, Radcliffe Brown is not referred to as a functionalist, but as a structural functionalist. Now, of course, for purposes of your exam, today's lecture is as far as you need to go. But I think you'll find out or discover that when Dr. Rasmussen lectures next week, that on um, both times, that uh, one of the things she'll be talking about and emphasizing is uh, Durkheim's influence on structuralism and that contribution to anthropology. So I've already told you that Radcliffe Brown uh, translated some of the major ideas of uh, 
Durkheim into English and made them part of his contribution to uh, anthropology. But the, and that should serve as a connecting point for her lectures. Uh, but again, this is not information that you will be responsible for on this first exam anyway. Okay, uh, in terms of Ra uh, Radcliffe Brown's theory, then I think I started off. Yes, you have a question? Um, you were just saying that Radcliffe Brown, what was his relationship to being a structural functionalist rather than just a functionalist? What's the difference? We're going to get to it right now. <laughs> uh, um, Radcliffe Brown, in terms of his theory, I had this notion, I think I started to talk about last time, of that societies were stuck together. They were they were made interdependent, they were structurally related uh, or integrated by this no, uh, akin, analogous to a model of biological structure. So that is the unit he felt or thought at that time, the unit of analysis for biological organisms was that it was a cell. He felt that and cells function together to form tissues and tissues function together to form organs and organs function together to form structures or systems or bodies uh, that he used a similar model in terms of his putting forth notions about how society was constructed. In other words, he would look at a society and he would try to uh, divide it down into its basic elements and then he would say these elements function together to form larger units of social structure. He was interested and made a distinction or contributed to a discussion that became very important in British anthropology in succeeding years between social structure and social organization, which is very akin to the uh, concepts in American anthropology of real culture, ideal culture and real culture, or ideal culture and behavioral culture which uh, most of you, I assume, have covered probably in one of your introductory classes. Uh, but again, it's just a notion that there's what we do every day, there's how we respond to things, and that's real culture, or in this case, real uh, social behavior, so it would be part of social organization. And that reflects models that we have in our minds, templates, if you will, of behavior or the way things we think things ought to be done. And so an American anthropology became formulated or uh, transcribed in terms of uh, ideal culture versus real or behavioral culture. In British anthropology, it became transcribed into social structure versus social organization. In both cases, you had people playing off these notions and, and telling you that we're um, culture change, or in the case of British anthropology, social change comes from is the influence or interplay between social organization and social structure on the one hand and behavioral culture or real culture and ideal culture on the other. So he had this model, this biological model, this organismic model, this construct uh, that we call today structural functionalism and he thought that you could you know, describe the integration of societies that way. And, you know, he said that what anthropology was about was comparative sociology, which is, a, as you know from remarks that I made last time, is a very different description than any American anthropologist would give it. We, those of us especially who are schooled in that four-field approach of linguistics, biological anthropology, archaeology, and ethnology, um, don't understand, or at least it did not immediately understand what he meant, or intended when he said that anthropology should be uh, comparative sociology, which made sociologists happy, <laughs> but didn't do much for those of us in anthropology. Uh, anyway, uh, now let's go. Uh, I, you know, structural functionalism and functionalism is that, again, it's just this notion to answer more directly the student's question from before is just that Radcliffe Brown's theory gives rise to a notion of the structure of society and the structure of the, and in the sense of the way the society functions, whereas Malinowski's only talks about the functions, but it doesn't talk very much about the structure. He sees social institutions arising out of a need to satisfy those biological universals of thirst, hunger, kinship, sex, what have you. And uh, so that would be the, the distinction in a very general sense. <laughs>
Okay, uh, looking at your handouts, and I'll, I'll read them aloud for our home viewers, but again, it, it is available or will be available to you today, uh, just as soon as we can get it on the website. Uh, and this comes from a man by the name of Gerald Brochi, who wrote a, a very small book, actually, that I used to use in this class a long time ago. Uh, and it, it's, it's actually an excellent adjunct, but again, it's one of those things that, or one of those publications that is no longer in print. Uh, but it's a good summary. It has good little summaries in it of these various uh, schools or approaches or chapters in theories of culture, both in British anthropology and in American anthropology. So he wrote, uh, for functionalism, uh, one page worth. <laughs> That's what I'm offering you today. Uh, functionalism in anthropology was part of a broad movement that pervaded the social and behavioral sciences during the early decades of the 19th century. In anthropology, functionalism developed as a reaction uh, against the evolutionist and diffusionist approaches. The same way we could say that cultural relativism developed as a reaction to the functionalist, or excuse me, the evolutionist and diffusionist approaches. The functionalist approach emphasized the importance of studying culture, a culture, as an integrated system in which each component makes a functional contribution to the whole. Of course, the simple idea of functional interrelatedness was not new. Foreshadowed in the social philosophy of classical antiquity, it had been expressed in the writings of many social thinkers and was implicit in the theories of historical and diffusionist schools. In this sense, a major contribution of the functionalists lies in their elaboration of an old and fundamental idea. This is very true. Functionalism has been around as a concept or a construct uh, as long as positivism and had been a part of the discussion of uh, things sociological and cultural for a long time. So Radcliffe Brown and Malinowski each formulated his own version of functionalism, as I gave you kind of a thumbnail sketch of just a moment ago. The accent placed on the differences between the two versions has sometimes obscured their similarities and complementarity. If you remember that general definition I gave you last time off the top of my head of a, a definition of the construct of functionalism, that it is a, uh, functionalism is a construct that um, provides for the, um, what is it, well-being and maintenance of society. Uh, it, it's referring to this area right here, that their views are actually similar to one another more than they're distinctive, and they complement one another more than they, di than they diverge. But again, given that structure of the British higher uh, education system, uh, they oftentimes uh, would embellish and exaggerate their differences at the expense of noting their similarities, because the point was to be number one and to eradicate your uh, competitor. So both viewed as society as structured then into a working unity in which, the work, in which the parts are accommodated to one another in a way that maintains the whole. And that's what they mean by, by maintenance. Uh, thus the function of a custom or institution is the contribution. Custom would be the word that Radcliffe Brown would use. Institution is the word that uh, Malinowski would use. Um, I guess, uh, thus, the function of a customer institution is the contribution it makes to the maintenance of the entire system of which it is a part. On the whole, sociocultural systems function to provide their members with adaptations to environmental circumstances and to connect them in a network of stable social relationships. This is not to say that the functionalists fail to recognize internal social conflict or other forms of disequilibrium. However, they did believe that societies tend to maintain their stability and internal cohesion. This is not unlike cultural relativism. Again, I want to bring you back to a similarity or, or the comparative notions of that. And what I'm thinking of there is that, if you remember, uh, Ruth Benedict told you that societies or cultures were integrated because they had an underlying psychological drive or an underlying uh, summative principle, or an underlying configuration. All those, were, those three were synonyms for each other. 
In another way, you could talk about functionalism then as always ascribing to every society around the world as having the same function, a universality of function, if it will. And that is that it provided for the well-being and ongoing, ongoing well-being and maintenance of a stable social relationships or social structure. Um, one of the, uh, in former times, major um, American sociologists uh, who took some of these notions of uh, functionalism that Malinowski and Radcliffe Brown wrote about, his name was Robert Merton, and he would talk about his concept of dysfunction. In my quotes there. <laughs> um, and dysfunction is a notion that he injected into the discussion so that he, he felt that it made functionalism as a construct more capable than of taking into account change. If you remember last time, I, I told you that uh, uh, one of the things about functionalism as a construct is that it's ahistorical, that they didn't feel a need to uh, bring history or change into the discussion. Uh, because they wanted a theory that would justify or rationalize the existence of the British Empire and what it had done and why it had come into existence. And so they were appeasers of some kind. Uh, but it didn't serve well for the interests of the larger group of social scientists who were interested in functionalist approaches or integrative approaches, as you care to describe it. So in doing that, Merton talked about dysfunction. So he thought that if you looked at a group of elements and they could be interdependent with one another, but if one of them were changed, it would then cause the interdependence to collapse or unravel. And that would bring about a dysfunction. And dysfunction, in turn, could lead to, depending on which uh, approach you're talking about, either social change or culture change. Um, you know, many things happen that, that, that in one context, a particular cultural element or element of a society is functional and is operating in a, uh, a humming, uh, well-maintained social structure in terms of those models that, that functionalists used. But if something changed in the society or the, or the culture, something even in the environment, then it could, it could reverberate throughout this whole entire system. Whatever else is that these approaches are, they're systemic approaches, uh, both cultural relativism and functionalism. Um, let me give you an example. In, uh, there's an anthropologist by the name of Lauriston Sharp who wrote an article called Steel Axes for a Stone Age People. Just one little article, and he'd spent a you know a career talking about Aboriginal peoples in in Australia, but none of that writing is as famous or as enduring as this one article that he wrote about uh, natives, uh, called again "Steel Axes for a Stone Age People," and what he was able to show in that was that you had a a traditional system, uh, um, a system that had been in place for several generations, many generations, multi-generational, and that it was stable and that everything was humming along, as a functionalist would say, a society's hum along, although I don't know if they would use that particular word. But one of the main connecting points, pivotal points, if you will, uh, for keeping that society in ongoing well-being and maintenance was the knowledge that the elders and authority had for making the stone axes that they had. So they derived their authority because they had the knowledge and skills to make those axes. And everyone else in that group or in that society uh, acquiesced to their authority, accepted their authority because they were in charge and they had this specialized knowledge. Europeans contacted them, came into contact with them, saw these axes, decided, my, those look just like the steel axes we have at home. Why don't we give them a whole bunch of them? And in turn, that will, you know, it just help them out a lot. And of course, what it did was it destroyed their society. 
things that had been functional became, in Merton's terms, dysfunctional. Uh, it reverberated throughout the entire society, just replacing steel axes, or excuse me, stone axes with steel axes, caused the whole authority structure of this traditional society to be undermined and caused uh, it to break down, and the people became often examples what often takes place when Western capitalistic society came into contact with native peoples. It made them dependent and um, poor <laughs> in the larger context. Okay, uh, so going back now then to the handout. Um, in their analyses, the functionalists attempted, attempted to interpret societies as they operate at a single point or as they operate over short periods of time. This would refer to their synchronic nature. This was not because the functionalists opposed in principle the study of history. Instead, it was a consequence of their belief that very little reliable information could be secured about the long-term histories of primitive peoples. Uh, this in spite of the fact that American anthropologists had done a lot of work already at this time, even under, under the aegis of Franz Boas, on folk histories and oral histories. And at this, and this early chapter of that early Boasian period that I didn't talk about at the time, but I'll make note of it now, is that folklore was a central uh, focus of study uh, by Boasians. And folklore was a way of eliciting from native peoples myths and legends and notions about, I wouldn't call it history, but something about a reconstruction of history as, is it, as it was embedded in those, culture, those cultural uh, models that people had or were, were supplied with. So when he talked with the Kwakiutl about you know, the emphasis or the impact of the potlatch, uh, it was with the notion of, you know, what, how did this come into being? What was its larger uh, mythical uh, stature that it gave these people in terms of uh, knowing who they were and where they had come from? And those things were always important. You know, uh, when we ask an American, for example, a student or whomever, you know, where do you come from? We always think in terms, well, I come from Illinois and you come from Texas or something like that. But if you ask a native person, where do you come from? And this is almost a universal aspect of traditional societies. They would refer something back to something kinship. They would refer back to a way in which they're related to a larger group of people from whom they're descended. Ancestors that would, that make uh, things very important. And in doing so, they encapsulate or embed these notions many times in creation myths, in um, other kinds of myths that are important to that society and culture. We, the ones we have seem almost ridiculous by comparison. Uh, and the only ones I can think of are things like Paul Bunyan and the Blue Ox, which really doesn't tell me much about where I come from. It does tell me a lot about, and uh, in, in, in if anyone believes or shares in that myth, that we have about Paul Bunyan, it, it gives some, or at least a partial account for, our mo uh, for Americans' emphasis upon size and quantity and that aspect of our culture. But it, and it feeds into capitalism, obviously, in more modern day times. But in terms of uh, a creation myth or an origin myth or knowing where we come from, I suppose we'd have to go back to biblical scripture. But, you know, my history is not the history of the Jewish people. It is culturally speaking, maybe. It is in terms of religious history, but not in terms of kinship, affiliation, and identity. So, uh, American anthropologists under Franz Boas, again, felt this was an important aspect of studying other peoples, especially traditional societies. And they did this under the rubric of folklore. More recently, folklore has come back into Anthropology is an important subject of study, uh, especially as it relates to hermeneutics, semiotics, and other, um, you know, uh, attributions of, of uh, postmodern and poststructural approaches to the study of human behavior. Um, so, getting back to the handout again. Um, it wasn't that these functionalists were opposed in principle to the study of history. Instead, it was a consequence of their belief 
that very little reliable information could be secured about the long-term histories of primitive peoples. So they felt in British society, or in, in Britain, or in England, that the people who were members of their empire couldn't really give them reliable histories because nobody was around to record history. It wasn't an important part of that society or culture that they didn't have written languages, so they couldn't have done it even if they saw it as an important part. But as I say, American anthropologists for a long time have had this notion that oral history is important and that one can uh, get a lot of cultural information about asking people about their past whether or not, quote, they were historically accurate in, uh, in a Boazian notion of historical particularism. It's rather, it's the perception of what had come in the past that was important. Um, their rejection of the conjectural reconstructions of the evolutionists and diffusionists were based largely on this conviction. Notice this is a, a common, char a, sh a shared characteristic that the relativists shared with the functionalists. They both reject evolutionary notions, but they do it very differently. The British thought that they were rejecting evolutionist and diffusionist notions in their rejection of history as a necessary part of the explanation of what happens. And American anthropologists thought they were rejecting evolutionary and diffusionist approaches to the study of human behavior by retaining a notion of history, but a different notion of history. Not the large universal history of humanity, but the particular history of each society as elaborated in historical particularism. Radcliffe Brown shared with Durkheim, and there's that connection again, with the, the emphasis on studying the conditions under which social structures are maintained. I would have added, had uh, Radcliffe Brown been a contemporary of mine, and Thankfully, he isn't, because I wouldn't be here <laughs> if he were, uh, or very old. <laughs> you know, some of you may say I am anyway, <laughs> but you're not to be included in my preferred group. Um, that, you know, if you talk about the conditions under which social structures are maintained, you should also, implicit in that discussion then, would be also a set of notions about the ways in which social structures are not maintained. And that would get you into Mer Merton's notion of social dysfunction, which Radcliffe Brown never elaborated on or went into. He also believed that the functioning of societies, Radcliffe Brown, uh, like that of other natural systems, is governed by laws that can be discovered through systematic comparison. The discovery of social laws is the main task of comparative anthropology, or what has been called social anthropology. You'll note that in many British universities, if you see the Department of Anthropology, oftentimes it is called the Department of Social Anthropology. And again, that would be a department that would focus on anthropology as kind of the anthropology of traditional societies, non-complex societies. It would be a department that would focus on um, social anthropology only, and not archaeology, not linguistics, and not biological anthropology. And that's because Radcliffe Brown and Malinowski stood in pivotal influence on British anthropology in a very similar way that Boaz was pivotal in his influence on American anthropology. So they had uh, not only their own influence at the time that they were in ascendancy, so to speak, but all their students who were the major British anthropologists of the 60s, 50s, 60s, and 70s uh, traced their roots or their affiliation to um, the pedigrees that they had academically or pedagogically speaking with these two British anthropologists, either Radcliffe Brown or Malinowski. So in a way, that's what I want to give you about functionalism. And, and I hope you see that it's very comparable to cultural relativism, that if I go over those four characteristics or identifying markers of functionalism, uh, ahistorical, uh, interdependent, uh, synchronic, uh, 
I guess that's what well, that's yeah. Synchronic and what was the fourth one? I remember. Holistic. Holistic. Thank you. Uh, that you see that that cultural relativism would be similar in all respects except one, that it was not a historical. You know, it, it did have that notion of historical particularism that uh, Boaz gave them. So uh, to conclude this, I want to talk about why I think functionalism on the one hand probably constitutes or is embedded in 90, um, this is an arbitrary figure, <laughs> but it's just to show you the, the extent of it. I would say 90% of all anthropological writings are functional in nature. No matter who the anthropologist is, no matter what their historical antecedents were, they're functional. Because anthropologists and other social scientists are constantly or continually talking about the interrelatedness of elements or the interrelatedness of society, the integration of society, or the disintegration of society. It's still based on these notions, these functional notions. But on the other hand, while that attests, I think, to functionalism's larger influence in Western civilization, as that handout indicated, much outside of just Malinowski and Radcliffe Brown, that at the same time, it's largely, I think, um, a non-explanatory theory. And probably the reason I'm biased this way is my own training as a materialist as opposed to being a functionalist in the British school. And that leads me to, to make the assertion that largely functional explanations are word games. They, you know, Malinowski was able to, in his legacy of being a field worker, or at least in his perception, uh, and his legacy or perception of being a field worker, was able to talk about a single element of a society and show you the way in which it contributed to the a functioning and ongoing well-being of that society and that it was important to do that for every single element of a social structure that at the same time it really didn't explain anything because for me history is an important element in explanation and I can't see that anything is really explained without that notion of history or even prehistory being included and now I want, to, I want to show you the way in which I see that it kind of leads you into mind games. At the same time, you think you're getting an understanding of a society or social structure. So this, just allow me to digress a little bit, to give you this example, to discuss it, but to realize that I'm using this discussion as an illustrative model that I think promotes this notion that functionalism is not a, as helpful as maybe the British anthropologists originally would have us believe. In, American, in popular American culture, we have such news magazines which were really important as Time and Newsweek, U.S. News and World Report, and various others that have come on the scene more recently. And in these magazines that purport to cover for you all the important changing events that are occurring in our society and culture, we have one that, a story that keeps re-emerging or resurfacing. Uh, no, I wouldn't say even every generation. It's much more often than that. Every two years or so, <laughs> there's an article on it. And that is, uh, since these are American magazines, they function on American, or they, they purport to describe mostly American culture, um, more so than they uh, describe other cultures in the world. They oftentimes talk about the disintegration of the American family. Right, they talk about how the American family is under assault by various weapons <laughs> of uh, social uh, destruction and that uh, the family is not going to be able to withstand and therefore they can account then for the high rate of divorce that occurs in American society and culture. In other words, religious institutions have been attacked uh, by anthropologists and others <laughs> who are moral relativists. And in turn, that has led to a lessening of impact of a religious faith and institutions on American society. This has led to an increase in drug use, an increase in youth violence, an increase in you name it, they'll report it. And they'll attribute it all to the disintegration of this mythical nuclear family 
in the United States. And the high divorce rate attests to that uh, disintegration, disintegration. Notice this second time I pronounced it to so, show you that it's related to integration, which is a word I've used before in connection with cultural relativism. Well, how does that sound to you? Is that a, a worthy explanation of what's going on? Is that a, an accounting that you see that it makes you understand better what is going on right around you and possibly might be a part of those families that you might be engaging in yourself? I mean, some of you are becoming married now or have been married for a couple of years or so, uh, and you're having children, and you're now a unit, <laughs> if you will, in American society and culture and Republicans love you and want your vote. And again, I'm making, I'm making light, but I'm not, you know, it's just a joke. <laughs> um, is this an accounting? Is this an explanation of anything? Well, to either say yes or no, <laughs> if you're not making a comment. Yes. I'm not even seeing <laughs> Thank you. One yes. person says yes, and the rest of you are undecided. <laughs> Uh, or is this just another notion or another way of, of giving you an example of the ways in which many times correlation is confused with explanation? You know, many times when you're using statistics, the person will tell you who's your statistician that, you know, uh, you can use statistics to manipulate data, or you can manipulate the data that statisticians use and say anything you want to. Well, statistics as a model is really functionalism as a model. They're identical. And so uh, whether the one uses numbers, functionalists use social elements or social units. So going back to this discussion again, are you explaining anything? No, <laughs> you're not. Uh, to show that there's somehow a correlation between uh, rates of divorce and uh, religious um, failings or youth violence, incidents of youth violence, say, because that's one that's on the minds of a lot of people these days, or say drug use, in incidents of drug use. One of these things is not necessarily causal in terms of the other just because both are increasing or in case as one increases the other decreases in the sense of religious conviction or in the example of religious conviction um, would not be an explanation it's merely a correlation and correlation is the statistician tells you and the glint of an idea comes across his mind and it's supposed to inspire you know that light bulb going on in your head uh, uh, a correlation is not causation. So this is not a causal kind of explanation. Functionalism is not. And for a materialist, that's really important, and that's how I'm trained. So I'm not sure that, that uh, hum more humanistic uh, approaches in the study of anthropology would find the functionalist um, uh, less than acceptable. But certainly for those of us who are more materialist in our notions of society and culture, we find it weak in this area because it is not causal and doesn't pretend to be causal and doesn't lead into a discourse of causality in terms of social and cultural, beha cultural behavior. Uh, so that's, that's kind of the, uh, the extent to which I wanted to discuss functionalism at, at this level, in this course. Uh, if we were in uh, uh, other courses, we might take it to a more a detailed uh, uh, accounting, but that's all I want to do for this time. And in fact, Dr. Rasmussen will probably, also she'll be calling it structuralism in her case and the examples that she'll want to use. And also she'll be talking about structuralism versus post-structuralism and modernism versus post-modernism. And when she talks about modernism to the extent that she does, translate there that she's actually talking about Boaz and Malinowski and all these folks who wrote in the generations of anthropology in the first half of the century. Okay, and that's next time, so it's not, again, within the uh, confines of what you're going to be covering on your exam. <laughs>
or will be covered on that exam. So this is the extent of the information from lecture today is that you need to include or need to at least examine in terms of your um, take-home exams. Okay, what we're going to do now is quickly go over a review of what we covered this semester so far and for purposes of your exam. And then at the end of that time, I'm going to go over it as quickly as I can to allow some time um, for you to ask questions that you may have or that you want me to answer or at least attempt to answer or have other people in the class attempt to answer in terms of an exchange. Yes. I just wanted to make a correctional note in case someone ever watches the uh, video without the handout. Mm -hmm. um, when you began your discussion of the handout, you inadvertently said the 19th century instead of the 20th century. Where? So it was the other decades of the 20th century. Yeah. Oh, as I re read it, I said 19. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you. <laughs> I, didn't, I wouldn't be able to recall that <laughs> until I see the tape, which I won't. <laughs> Anyone else have any comments? Okay. Th thanks, Sean. Um, okay. Uh, essentially, what I've talked about this entire semester so far has been three approaches, as I promised you I would, in the study of, uh, of uh, societies and cultures. And they are classical evolutionists. Uh, cultural relativists and functionalists. Um, classical evolution, of course, refers to those notions of, uh, as given us by Lewis Henry Morgan and Edward Tyler, in Edward Tyler in British anthropology and Lewis Henry Morgan in American anthropology, and they prom they put forth notions, if you will, of uh, culture as being um, stages in development that occurred of an evolutionary nature. And, they, and again, in terms of showing the significance and the larger significance in terms of the cultures and societies in which they were embedded, uh, this was a product or a function of, <laughs> notice here what I'm, the words I'm using, of uh, social Darwinism. That they existed at a time that the, there was a kind of distortion or a popularization of Darwinian notions that were involved or came or emanated from that publication in 1859 on, uh, by Darwin. And in that elaboration, in that applying those notions or principles to the study of human behavior, uh, they came to talk about these evolutionary uh, models for cultural evolution. And so they talked about stages of society, going from one to the other, of, of savagery, barbarism, and civilization. And again, I gave you the model as given us by Lewis Henry Morgan. But actually, if you go back into the writings of Western thinkers, and you go back to the 18th century, to the Enlightenment, to the notions of... Um, cultural development, and stages of cultural elev uh, evolution. They've been around for quite a while. They weren't original with the thinkers of the latter part of the 19th century. They were very much a part of the 18th century. And in, in that 18th century time, they also talked about stages of cultural development. But many times the stages they talked about were greater in number and more elab elaborated upon. And one of the reasons why I like to provide you with Morgan, Morgan's model is that it's, it's simplistic somewhat compared to some of those because some of those uh, other earlier models, uh, John Locke, for example, and others, is that he would g have given us several stages in the uh, development of, of, of culture uh, from the beginnings of the nascent beginnings of time to the present to civilization in the uh, evolutionist British evolutionists and American anthropologists uh, time. And it would have been much more than we needed. <laughs> so we get across the notions and the ideas in talking about three stages of cultural development, as I gave you before. Um, savagery, barbarism, and civilization. And as the political elections warm up, I hear some of those very notions coming out, those very cultural notions of social Darwinism. Although, of course, it would be very unpopular today 
for you to realize that the same person who's decrying from the height of his voice or her voice about how uh, evolution is a gift of the devil at the same time is using social Darwinian models to explain poverty, wealth, <laughs> etc., and justifying the privileged few as, a part, as opposed to the larger groups of impoverished masses that exist in the world. I noted this morning our own senator uh, talking about uh, royalties and the oil companies, for example, and how that they were entitled to those kinds of uh, gifts. <laughs> okay, without getting in further into trouble. Uh, then, and, and you can see then how the, there's an exchange between culture and society and theoretical models that social scientists come up with. That's what I covered principally in the uh, first part in the uh, capitalism triumphant that uh, Eric Wolf called it in his writings and it's called uh, in my own lectures I referred to it as that notion of social Darwinism and uh, both American and British anthropology at that time in terms of classical cultural evolution and in talking about those uh, notions or constructs of culture. They had certain characteristics that were a part and parcel of those um, theories, no matter who was the author. One of them is that culture is progressive, so that a later stage in society is by its nature uh, better than or, or advanced uh, to an earlier state, stage in society, that um, Obviously, if one looks at those notions, one sees that there are, that cultures evolve at different rates. And that's how you can explain, for example, the presence of uh, more traditional societies in contemporary times. Uh, but it means that if you leave them alone, which we don't, of course, but if you had left them alone, that eventually, as need uh, or their nature uh, inspired them, need would come from more environmentally minded folks, uh, uh, and sometimes in the same author, and uh, nature coming from more um, nature concerned uh, anthropologists. And those Henry Morgan, I think, involves both, and his notion of productive technology would have given this things, uh, this included this notion of the importance of environment, but his notion of psychic unity of mankind that we talked about would have importantly led us to a notion of it is in the nature of humans to go or evolve from one stage or another, especially when it becomes a group of humans. And you'll find from one, and this is something I have not talked about that much, except when I mentioned super organic uh, somewhere along the way, um, that there's always this notion of collective consciousness there's always this notion that there's a, a, a society that exists beyond the individual and that groups of individuals somehow are important. And each generation of anthropologists has accepted or elaborated on those sets of notions in different ways. I'm not going to add that now to your required knowledge because it's, you've, you've got enough for the exam. Um, okay, uh, I talked to you how there were uh, that cultural or classical evolution was in part a response to the notion of cultural degeneration, which would have been the account that, that stems from a more biblical or theological interpretation of events uh, that anthropologists didn't see, um, that things that we had come through a process of cultural degeneration as would be elaborated upon in the Adam and Eve accounting, but rather that all peoples somewhere in this universal history of humanity at one time, all of our ancestors were hunters and gatherers, or as these folks would have called them, savages, and that we represent uh, later stages uh, coming from those same people. Uh, rather than experiencing the fall from grace, then starting over at the bottom and then coming forward, uh, that on the one hand, uh, these anthropologists, these early social thinkers, or at least early with respect to us, uh, rejected theological notions. But on the other hand, they fully embraced them. 
They were uh, revolutionaries in their own time in terms of thought, uh, in thinking about preceding generations, but at the same time, they embraced theological notions and promoted those perceptions of Christianity and Judeo-Christianity that were prevalent at the time, although they were unaware of it. This, again, comes from hindsight, not from what they thought they were about. Um, so then I talked about that there were three assumptions in, in, uh, uh, the by the classical evolutionists. And I touched the, on them a little bit today already. Uh, one of them is uh, the psychic unity of mankind. The second was parallel evolution. And the third was um, the comparative method. Uh, what is today called the comparative method. Uh, but what at that time refers to the fact they were trying to explain or account for the existing of great diversity as their own um, progenitors had discovered in the 15th, 16th, and 17th, 18th centuries. Uh, had gone out into the world and dis discovered all kinds of people that the New Testament and the, nor the Old Testament talked to anyone about. And they were trying to give an accounting of those folks. All right, then I went into, after I elaborated on that enough for you, uh, or at least what I thought was enough, uh, I went beyond then this period of capitalism triumphant into a notion of, or to a, theor or a level of um, intermittent liberal reform, again, as it was called or labeled by um, Eric Wolf. And that, in other terms, other times, has been called Boaz in the American School of Anthropology. And essentially that became a great elaboration upon these notions of cultural relativism. And in turn, in ex giving you cultural relativism, I had to go back and give you two chapters or two stages. <laughs> you know, I use all kinds of theories here in my own presentation of these materials. In many ways, uh, my presentation of this in this class could be called the cultural relativity of anthropological theory. But that's another day, another time, another class. Um, in doing that, though, you, you know, they were divided into two parts, early Boaz and later Boaz. In early Boaz, he, in his reaction to the diffusionists and um, evolutionists of the 19th century, he comes up with this notion or elaborates upon this notion of historical particularism. That there's no universal history of humanity. There is this uh, particular or multi-historical accounting of people in terms of every group of people that exist in the world. To the extent that they exist, they had an, a, a history that's unique or particular to them. Hence, he turned it into a fancy phrase. Anthropologists did and still do called historical particularism. As I told you, that's the kind of uh, anthropology that personally I would have been revolted by, uh, uninterested in, and would have rejected and gone on to become a, uh, a student of German literature or something <laughs> that I found more interesting at the time. But that isn't where it was left, and that isn't where Boaz, Boaz and his students left it either. Rather, they eventually came up with these notions of, well, so you have these traits, you have these uh, elements of culture that are given you by um, historical accident and incident. They come about uh, through diffusion and adaptation as processes of explanation. And so once you have them, their presence or absence of them, how do you explain then what happens or what's added to that? And that later, or Boaz, uh, is where we get uh, elaborations upon this notion of cultural relativism is a cultural construct and is an explanatory paradigm even. Um, it's one of the few that both cultural relativism and functionalism are the two cultural constructs that anthropologists put forward that can um, ascend to this notion of paradigm as exemplified by a philosophy of science writer by the name of Kuhn, K-U-H-N or as a person who's been elaborated up upon even more recently by uh, Lett, Ronald Lett, in his description of the philosophy of science. 
I'm not sure if his first name is Ronald, but it's, his last name is Lett, L-E-T-T. Uh, anyway, always giving you more information than you need. <laughs> uh, they elaborate on this notion of cultural relativism, and I talked to you at great length then about uh, how it was uh, a cultural construct or a notion of society and human behavior that, uh, that it's a whole or a system that's um, more than, any, than it's the sum of its parts and immediately that should call forward in your mind that that's a, that's a notion or an idea that came in it to anthropology via Franz Boas and Ruth Benedict from Gestalt psychology or what's called by psychologists Gestalt psychology, which has this notion that a whole is more than the sum of its parts. And then I try to give you many ways in which that could be represented. And I started off initially by talking about Eskimo culture and society and elaborating upon that quite a bit or to a great extent. I think it's the strongest uh, elaboration I've given you in terms of ethnography. At the same time, I kept bouncing back and forth between, between a cultural relativistic notion of this accounting of Eskimo ethnography and postmodern critiques of it. Well, I didn't always call it that. But I said, you know, this was very much a, involved the notion of uh, an ethnographic present, which today we would reject. But at that time, people just accepted. And again, to remind you, an ethnographic present is this notion that when you're talking about other peoples, you can present or collapse, really, the sum total of their historical experience into an account, one accounting of their culture in terms of that holistic formulation given you by cultural relativism. And that uh, in doing that, uh, you know, we can call that the ethnographic present. And that's, anthropologists saw nothing distractive about that or incorrect about that, that that was okay to do. So then we get these holistic accountings, these notions that uh, Cultures are made up of elements, and in terms of these elements are integrated into more holistic uh, structures that in that interdependency, which is what the holism refers to, that there is somehow something greater than that the sum total of any one of those individual elements. And that's what Ruth Benedict meant when she talked about the summative principle or a configuration or a... What was the other thing I said? It's the underlying psychological drive. It was that configuration of elements that was greater than the sum of the whole. So again, when we look at that accounting I give you of Eskimo culture, or at least alleged accounting of Eskimo culture, uh, I had to say, you know, I came back and I said, you know, what is it that, that's larger than the sum of those individual elements or parts? And I referred to the fact that it was, it was survival. It was this... Uh, notion that there was a value that they had that was larger than all the other values they had. That was more important that you could take any culture and see that there are more important values and lesser values. And it's those more important values around which people organize their daily lives and the ways in which they perceive the world. Um, All right, I went from there <laughs> to um, a discussion after I went over the great detailing of Eskimo culture. I went to a discussion of uh, a still in cultural relativism in that unit of the course into a discussion of Benedict's writings in The Patterns of Culture and her book, her monograph, The Patterns of Culture in which she uh, talks very much about her model of cultural relativism. And she uses four societies. And we've, we discussed, uh, more importantly, two of them. And I, and I discussed two of them as for illustrative purposes, to show you the kinds of ways in which she thought and the kinds of ways in which she thought you could take these notions. Number one, that that culture is made up of patterns of culture, that behaviors can be generalized upon and we can abstract from them and we don't have to uh, stay within the minutiae 
actually within what I would today call the richness of ethnographic detail, but rather we can generalize upon those events and we can talk about patterns of behavior and then she in turn would talk about how those patterns of behavior are integrated into larger wholes or constructs or systems with many mutually interdependent parts. The parts now being, again, those patterns that we're talking about. And she talked about two societies uh, in, in that, at least in my discussion of them. Uh, and those were the Plains Indian Society of North America, um, sometimes known to you as the Apache, the Arapaho, the Sioux. Uh, and if you don't know how to pronounce those things, don't feel badly. In my first graduate, in my first graduate seminar as a graduate student, I kept in my presentation. I had a presentation to do on one of those groups of Indians, or Native Americans, and I kept talking about the Arapaho. So if you ever feel that you don't understand all these terms and you mispronounce them, know that I was very red in face when everyone in class started laughing at me unabashedly, including the professor. <laughs> and of course, I had no idea <laughs> why they were laughing, because uh, I called them the Arapaho. <laughs> it looked like a good way to pronounce it to me <laughs> at the time. So, uh, and, and I also talked to you a lot about what was embedded in, in, t in elaborating upon those two paragraphs from Patterns of Culture. I elaborated upon the basic notions that were underlying the cultural relativistic formation. And I talked to you about uh, adaptation, and I talked to you about diffusion. How, although in the previous chapter in American anthropology, diffusion was seen as something uh, unacceptable, that as time passed, diffusion came to be accepted as a major example of the kind of culture change that can come about as a result of two peoples coming into contact with each other. And on the one hand, you could talk about two people coming into contact who were more or less of equal de development in terms of their uh, technological expertise. And on the other hand, it became an important tool for discussing the interaction that occurred between a m more highly developed cultural group in terms of technology and a lesser developed cultural group in terms of technology, which drew anthropologists eventually into those discussions of the influence of European or Judeo-Christian societies upon native cultural traditions and cultures. Um, so I talked then again very importantly about the diffusionists and, and adaptation and how those notions then are continued from the 19th century into the 20th century, but in very different ways. And in the second paragraph, we went into a discussion or elaboration uh, not only of the Plains Indians, but also of the Pueblo Indians of the Southwest. And I gave you an accounting of certain cultural elements. And again, I used them primarily to show you uh, examples of the ways in which they were interdependent, the elements of those cultures and societies, and they were um, mutually reinforcing, or they were exhibited harmony. They did not exhibit um, dis, uh, what's that, what am I thinking? Um, Theories in, in sociology, for example, very importantly and very much earlier than anthropologists did, included these notions of, uh, or notion of, um, oh, what's the word? A conflict, conflict theory. So very much earlier than anthropologists, uh, sociologists in the United States and other parts of Europe and European uh, influence uh, talked about Marx and elaborated upon Marxist notions of society and culture. But anthropologists, by contrast, were very late in that, and that's because of this emphasis upon uh, solidarity, equilibrium, um, uh, integration. In other words, the, the models of anthropological explanation oftentimes were um, very positive in their accountings, and they showed in their, in their attempts to make uh, their accounts of societies non-ethnocentric, they would ex extrapolate upon the virtues of the cultures and societies of all peoples in the world, not only ours, but others. And in doing that, they put forth various notions uh, about what human behavior was about. 
So in sociology, you have the writings of Simmel, you have the writings of other folks that very importantly took in um, uh, conflict as a very important part of their explanation. One of the ways in which this really became apparent to me was in the early 70s, uh, even into the 70s, where uh, you had S James Spradley giving us an account of what he called urban nomads. And they were panhandlers, is what they were, and in Seattle. And he talked about them in a positive construct, or in a positive way, about how they, their behavior was organized by cultural cues and cultural markers that, that members of that, that culture of panhandlers could talk about. If we went to sociology, even in a previous time, they talked about the hobo. And the hobo was seen as kind of a cultural reject, as a person who exhibited a great deal of dysfunction and as a person who had been rejected by that society and culture and in becoming a panhandler represented somehow a diminished or poor image or shadow of that uh, culture or society. So I often see that as a good contrast. And it wasn't until after or later than or contemporaneous with Spradley's work and others that we have this important notion of conflict being brought into central discussions of American anthropology, which gets us then into uh, later, which you'll be presenting in class, some of you, Marvin Harrison's, Harris's notions of cultural materialism, or Julian Stewart's notions of cultural materialism. Uh, and then, uh, uh, more recently in that, we've gone into these discussions of functionalism as a contemporaneous uh, view of anthropological theory and human behavior that existed, that's what contemporaneous means, at the same time or alongside cultural relativism. And functionalism, of course, was the uh, principal explanatory model in British School of Anthropology, as cultural relativism was the explanatory model in uh, American anthropology. And functionalism also is uh, interacts with the larger society and culture uh, at that same time. And so you had the notion that Britain was very importantly uh, the head of an empire. And as head of an empire, uh, they had certain notions and concepts about native peoples, which were very importantly caught up in this construct of functionalism as used by British anthropologists, primarily in the writings of both Malinowski and Radcliffe Brown. So I've kind of now given you the overview. We don't have much time left. In fact, according to the yellow light that's blinking, is there a quick question that anyone has that they really had a burning desire, as they say in 12-step groups, uh, to ask before it's over today for today? Uh, certainly, I, I would give you permission to ask a question on Tuesday, as long as it isn't directly feeding into your answer uh, uh, for a particular question that we have on the exam, the take-home exam, that you are now going to be working on for the next week. But since the yellow light's on, I allow questions for Tuesday. <laughs> uh, so uh, today I've given you an overview, a real overview, of what we've covered thus far in this class. And it's a lot. You know, I just kind of skimmed the surface. Uh, and gave you a brief overview, but more uh, earlier in the class today, I talked or I kind of wound up the discussion of functionalism as a theoretical approach, as a cultural construct that anthropologists have used to explain um, cultures uh, around the world, and that's the primary uh, function 